on July? Uh, no, we do not. Uh, why did AFSC get involved in this one? What were the values that you found in common? Similar objections sustained. Uh, can you tell us about uh, what your role became as the coordinator for Occupy? What, what I was doing was I was um, convening discussions among American Friends Service Committee staff in different cities across the country to both get reports on what was going on in their area and also see what the organization as a whole could do to provide uh, greater support to this growing movement. Interacted with the Occupy movement here in New Hampshire. I'm going to allow this. Paying attention to the questions. I hope so. <laughs> so, um, well, it really began on October 3rd. Uh, at the same time, I was starting to take a national role within my organization, that I was also approached by uh, a woman named Sherry Gould who was trying to convene the first New Hampshire meeting to get the Occupy movement moving in New Hampshire. And I offered to have that meeting take place in my office, and I attended the meeting, uh, which took place the following evening, I believe. And then after that, I um, attended the first General Assembly, which was held in Arms Park. What is a General Assembly? A General Assembly is a community meeting uh, in which everybody who is present from the Occupy movement is able to participate in discussion and decision making. Uh, in which decisions are made uh, through a, a process of trying to find the consensus or a mutual agreement of everybody who is present. About how many people showed up to that meeting? I would say 50 or 60, perhaps. It was, it was getting dark, so it was a little hard to count. That's my recollection. And as a result of that first General Assembly, was there some decision made about uh, occupying a space here in um, New Hampshire? That, that group uh, agreed that there should be an occupation beginning in Manchester the following Saturday. And what were the reasons? Oh, excuse me, uh, a week, uh, a week hence, so like about ten days from the date of that, uh, from the date of that meeting. What were the reasons that were given for the occupation? Well, the whole point is uh, the whole point of the Occupy movement is to call attention to the great disparities of, of, of wealth and income that exist in this country and how that leads to an unjust concentration of political power in the hands of those who control that bulk, that, that vast amount of, of wealth, and to say that something needs to be done to bring about change in order to have or restore uh, an actual democratic society. Um, were you present uh, at the time when the occupation began on October 15th? Yes. And it actually, where did, what park did it start in? Well, it started in, um, in Veterans Park in Manchester, uh, which is a large park in the central part of the city. And uh, it was, you know, it was a very, very visible space there. So there were, uh, there were more than 250 people who were present at that time. Uh, did the, uh, on October 15th, the first day of the occupation, did the occupiers remain in Veterans Park? Uh, no, there were um, a couple of marches that took place during the day in the downtown area, and then in the late afternoon, uh, there was a movement over to Victory Park a few blocks away, where people um, set up an encampment uh, to begin the, the actual overnight occupation. Um, Mr. Albert, from that point on, were you, did you remain I I involved with the people who were actually occupying? Yes, I did. What was your role? I, I, I did not spend the night in the park, but I came every, every day. I mean, I, I went home that, that night, I came back the next day for part of the day, I came back again on Monday, I came back again on Tuesday, I came back again on Wednesday, so that I was able to participate in the General Assemblies, uh, as well as uh, lead a couple of workshops about nonviolence and um, 
generally observe what was going on. Did you observe any violence in the uh, in the four days that you were in the parks? No, I did not. Did you observe any disruptive behavior? Um, well, I was actually in the midst of training a group of people in the techniques of peacekeeping um, on the very first evening. Uh, and uh, a fellow came up who was very agitated and ho had hostile intent. And I was able to talk to him or listen to him and um, encourage him to leave. Uh, other than that, I don't remember any, um, certainly the people who were participating within the movement uh, had uh, vigorous discussions but it was all uh, very, very peaceful. Did you see political signage when you were at the yes. Victory and Veterans Park? Yes. What were some of this, the political messages that were being expressed? Well, the, the fundamental message is we are the 99%, in a sense saying that the very small group of people at the top have concentrated altogether too much power, and the rest of us share something in common, and that we are, we are left out because of that and that we need to band together. But then there was just all sorts of some people calling attention to the banking system or to particular banks or some people linking the problems with the economy to the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan or some people talking about uh, workplace issues or people talking about political corruption and the need to get money out of politics. A lot of very creative stuff. These were not by and large mass produced signs. These were by and large uh, people with their own magic markers or poster paint. Uh, giving very personal expressions to their dissent about uh, the unjust situation that we face in this country. Did you see any interactions with the police um, during that four-day occupation? Uh, yes, I did. Could you describe the interactions that you observed? Well, I... I Objection, Your Honor. Um, may we approach? Actually, turn question. I reversed myself. Go ahead. Did you um, observe any uh, police uh, inter interactions over the four-day occupation? Well, certainly, there were police who were observing us. But um, I most specifically remember on the day that the occupation was ended, uh, I was present in the park when Captain Cunha arrived and addressed the General Assembly uh, and explained what was going to happen, and I remained there uh, through the rest of that night um, and observed the issuing of citations and the arrests that took place. All right. Let me then bring your attention to uh, October 19th at about 9 o'clock in the evening. Uh, did you have any uh, prior knowledge that, uh, that law enforcement might move to empty the park that night? There was general understanding that um, I think that we were expecting that that was going to be the night that the police were going to tell people that we had to leave the park. And what kind of preparations uh, were made to, uh, to deal with that occurrence? Um, arrangements had been made with uh, St. Augustine Church as a place where people could store some of the equipment 
uh, tents, and, you mean what? The tents and sleeping bags and uh, perhaps some food that had been donated, I'm not sure what else. Um, so that, that was something that was already in place. Um, I was talking with people about the importance of maintaining nonviolent discipline and a nonviolent demeanor uh, in interactions with the police during an arrest or uh, situation of potential you know, um, conflict with, with police. So that was, I suppose you could say, that was part of the preparation as well. Uh, Captain Kuna uh, approached the group at about 9 o'clock that night? That's correct. And in general, what was the discussion about? Um, Captain Cunha was extremely cordial. Uh, he asked if he could address the General Assembly. He had even learned some of the hand signals that people were using to uh, communicate with each other. Um, and he, so he asked and people welcomed him into the circle of people standing there um, in Veterans Park over by, by the, the Elm Street section. Um, and he explained that the city had decided that it could no longer allow this occupation to take place. He instructed people or explained very clearly that at about 11 p.m., uh, the hour that the curfew goes into effect, that he with members of the Manchester Police Department would return. He explained that if people did not willingly leave at that point, that they would be given citations for violation of the curfew, and if they still refused to leave, that they would be arrested for trespassing and removed from the park. Uh, he then left. All right. He then left, and there was now a two-hour interim period from 9 to 11. Mm -hmm. What occurred in the park during that two-hour interim period? Well, part of what happened was people cleaned up their gear and figured out what to do with it, and people brought stuff up to the church, and otherwise people you know, decided to leave some tent standing, uh, in a sense is symbolic of the encampment that had been there, and, um, and then waited for the police to show up. Um, was there a discussion about how people were going to act once the police arrived? Well, I think people were generally talking about that, and I, I was certainly um, trying to talk to people about that. I mean, I, I gave a little, I, I mean, I think of it now as, in a sense, a little pep talk about nonviolence and um, how, to, how to maintain nonviolent discipline or nonviolent demeanor during an arrest situation or during a situation in which people are uh, being, being confronted by it law enforcement authorities and told to stop doing what they want to be doing. Um, just one other question. Uh, were there, uh, uh, did you train uh, what you would call peacekeepers during the Occupy movement, the four-day encampment? Uh, I did on the first night of the occupation, I did a short workshop for people who were working, going to be working as peacekeepers uh, during, during the occupation. I also did a short workshop on the first day of the occupation on how to respond nonviolently to conflict. And what does the term peacekeeper mean to you? Well, what it means is that um, it's useful in a demonstration situation like this where you really don't know who might be coming in with ill intent. Uh, because a demonstration like this is going to be more successful if the participants can maintain a peaceful demeanor or a nonviolent demeanor, uh, it's important that they be ready to not um, escalate conflict, uh, including not respond with violence or with anger to people who have ill intent or who are disruptive or who want them to stop doing what they're doing. Uh, and it can be very useful for there to be, well, everybody ought to have that attitude and the skills to do that. It's very helpful for there to be some people who are singled out with special responsibility to be watchful for people who may be approaching with ill intent. Uh, or just watchful that if, if a discussion turns into a heated argument, to be able to walk over and say, hey, uh, can you calm down? You know, take a time out. I mean, just, you know, in a sense. So it's, there's a need to have some preparation in order to do that effectively and in order to be willing to step into a conflict situation, but, and to do so without yourself escalating the possibility of violence. And this is something I've, I have years of experience doing. Now, you were in the park in, uh, in some respect because you were doing your job. That was part of your job. In a sense, yeah. yeah. And um, as part of your job, did you study the messages of the Occupy movement? Well, yes. And I, I, mean, I, was, I, was, I mean, I was there in a number of capacities, as you say. So I was there as a participant in the movement because I agreed and agree with what it was trying to do. I was also there uh, to try to provide assistance 
to people uh, because of my experience with nonviolent training and with economic literacy education. And I was also there as an observer and was writing reports in my blog and sharing information with colleagues across the country about what was going on. So I was doing all those things at once. Could you explain to the, to the jury uh, why couldn't this? Why couldn't they? Uh, the Occupy movement promote its messages between seven and eleven, and then come back the next day at seven o'clock and stay till eleven. I mean, why did they need to stay overnight? Well, Judge Neal, may we approach? Sustained. Ron, may we approach? Mr. Albert, to, to use the words of the state, uh, you could have chosen to remain in Veterans Park and receive the citation or uh, be arrested for trespass on October 19th, is that correct? That's correct. And can you tell the jury why you did not? Well, at that time I felt like I had other, uh, in addi as I mentioned, as in addition to having, um, being a participant in the Occupy movement, I had other responsibilities as well and felt like I was, uh, you know, at that time that I should go home and write about it in my blog and be prepared to uh, do other things that I, I had other I had other responsibilities. No further questions. Thank you. Good afternoon. Hi. Um, now you said that you would go to the park every day, um, whether it was Victory or whether it was Veterans, and then you would leave. What time would you say that you got there? It was, it was different each day. I mean, on Saturday and Sunday, I was there more of the time. I had other uh, things I needed to do for work. I know that on the final day, I had an evening meeting, actually. And um, it, when my meeting got out, I drove, uh, I drove down to Manchester and got there in, uh, in time for the evening general assembly. And I might have been there earlier in the day as well and gone, gone back and forth. My office is in Congress, so it wasn't that hard to, to scoot back and forth. So what time would you say that you would leave there? Uh, obviously, you told us you were there to 11 o'clock on, uh, on the day that 
the police had come in to enforce the ordinance. What time would you generally stay there to during the week or during the other days? You know, I, I honestly don't remember exactly. I know that I was there when it was dark out on, um, certainly on that first Saturday on Tuesday. Um, I know I was there in the, in the evening. Would that be like leaving around six, seven o'clock or eight o'clock? It was later it than that. But nine o'clock? Yeah, later than that. Nine o'clock? ten o'clock perhaps. You would leave it Might have been 11, it might have been later. I don't, I really don't remember. Now, you just testified that you were present when the police came to Veterans Park, correct? Um, On October 19th, 2011? Yes. Now, prior to that, um, you had testified that um, during this Occupy, there, at some point, there was someone who had gotten, so, there was a heated, uh, somebody who had gotten heated at some point, um, and, and you helped, I guess, calm that person down. Did I understand that correctly? That's correct. So, you agree with me that there is a, there is a potential for violence when you have a number of people occupying one area, that there's a potential for violence. There's a potential for violence any time you have two people in a room, <laughs> or one person, I guess. So, it doesn't, um, So there is a potential for violence? There, there is always potential for violence in any circumstance. Now, you had advance notice, you, you testified about Kathy Cunha coming around 9 o'clock and giving you guys pretty much advance notice that people were going to be, uh, that they were going to come and, and get everybody out of Veterans Park, correct? That's correct. Now, you would agree with me that the people at the park that night had three options. Option number one was to leave without any citation. I'm sorry, you have to say it's not just because of the record. I, 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 that was, I thought you were going to give me all three options, and then I could say yes or no. Okay, I can absolutely do right. that. So option one, number one was to leave the park without any citation. Option number two was to stay and receive a citation and then leave. And number three was stay, re receive your citation, and then still stay and get arrested for criminal trespass. I believe that that's correct. And Captain Cunha told everybody there that pretty much these are your options. He was one, very two, clear. Three. And some individuals chose to leave the park without any, without anything, without a citation, without any rest. Is that right? That's correct. And you were actually one of them. I was one of them. How many people would you say left the park without receiving any citation and just left? Well, it's a little hard to say because it, it one of the things about this movement is sort of the, the line between who was part of it and who wasn't it was always a little murky. Um, so there were, by the time um, people were getting their citations issued, there was perhaps a dozen or two dozen people standing outside the fence along um, Central Street, is that what it's called there? Merrimack. Merrimack Street. Um, so there were, you know, there were a couple dozen people, but some of those were reporters, some of those were, were people who consider themselves out of the, a part of the Occupy movement. Some of them were people who I didn't really necessarily understand what they were doing there. And then there were the people who were inside the fence, which included both the police and the people who were uh, being issued citations. And how many people would you say um, received citations? I think it was 15 or 16 people. I don't recall exactly. And then, no, and then most of those people left, correct? Um, they then came to the outside of the fence and joined the others while the uh, that's correct. And then some, like the defendants, chose to stay and be arrested. That's correct. Well, they chose to stay. It was the police who chose to arrest them. <laughs> but you, you testified earlier that the police had told everybody that if you stay, you're going to be arrested for criminal trespass. That is right? correct. So you would agree with me that the defendants had a number of opportunities to leave and chose not to leave. That was their choice. That was their choice not to leave. Now, does the Occupy movement condone violating state and local laws? Um, the Occupy movement was operating in a historical context of nonviolent civil disobedience, um, and particularly focusing on the occupation of public space as a fundamental expression of the need to change our economic and political system. So in that sense, I would say the Occupy movement did in fact believe that um, violating some laws uh, was an appropriate and necessary act uh, to take. Okay, so your answer is yes, that Occupy Movement does condone violating state and local laws. Did I understand that correctly? Yes. One moment. And just uh, two more questions. You would agree with me that 
Uh, the police weren't trying to, the, the police weren't telling you what you could and could not say while you were at the park, correct? That's correct. And you agree with me that you could have moved um, your, your movement to the outside of the park onto the sidewalks, that they, they told you that you could do that, just not in the park. Um, there might have been, I don't, I don't recall that exactly. There might have been some other municipal ordinances or state laws that could have governed, um, you know, assembly on a sidewalk. It still would have, if it was still some type of public assembly, there might have been some other issues there. And I, I don't recall what people were instructed about that. Okay. So you didn't hear but Captain We know that the, the curfew uh, was explicitly referred to in the public parks, and the curfew did not apply to the sidewalks. And so, so you didn't hear Captain Cunha when he told um, when he told people that they could move it to the sidewalk, just don't block the sidewalk or the roadways. I, I, don't recall that exactly. And you agree with me that you could have uh, gone back there at seven a.m. the next morning, and that you that you knew that. Yes. Nothing further. Okay. How do you move to the sidewalks without blocking them? Well, if you stand on the edge of the sidewalk leaving room for other people to pass by. And that's just sort of normal courtesy as well as um, what we become accustomed to in terms of free expression. So. Okay. That's all. Thank you. Have a good day. Great. Thank you.